Thank you for the introduction. Um, yes, I'm Laura. I'm from Canada. Uh, it's actually my first time across the pond, so I'm experiencing jet lag. So if I start to like wobble, just throw something at me. Um, but today I'm going to be presenting on ROS for medical robots or slicer ROS2. So just for some quick background, I'll be talking about the general theme of image guided robotic interventions a lot. <laughs> of course, what I mean by that is using a combination of imaging and robotics to achieve some sort of therapeutic intervention. Um, as an engineer or developer, whenever we talk about these systems, I like to break them down into the components that go into them. Um, and I'll be using the Lupex by Bring them up as an example here, mostly because it's my favorite toy to play with at Hopkins. Um, but of course we have some sort of imaging system, in this case, an X-ray device, which we use to access things that we can't see with our naked eye. We then of course have our tracking system, which is how we tell our digital world where stuff like our patient and our tools are in the physical world. We then of course have a robot. In this case, it's a Gendry that rotates that X-ray to get different perspectives. And that's how we actuate systems in a robotic IGT platform. And then of course, all of this is pulled together in the navigation interface, which I like to think of as sort of the digestible output that we provide our surgeon with to uh, make interoperative <coughs> operative decisions. So focusing on the image guided therapy side of things, of course, for commercial systems like the Lupex, Usually you're limited by licensing agreements or very expensive SDKs. So as developers, I think we've learned a lot today that we turn to open source platforms like 3D Slicer, which Dr. Piper already explained why. So I don't need to get into it, but to reiterate, it can be used for a ton of different applications. We also, of course, need a way to talk to our hardware. So if we have stuff like sensors, tracking systems, and imaging devices, we can use something called the Plus Toolkit, which I've heard a few people mention today. It relies on the network protocol called OpenIDT Link to solve the challenge that's associated with all of these devices having different manufacturers, different data protocols, um, and needing access to that information in one place being tricky. So with Plus, you can do that. From there, if you're using, this looks a little bit overwhelming, but if you're using 3D Slicer and Plus, you've already gotten to this point where you have, of course, your information from your hardware in 3D Slicer. And it's a bit of an overwhelming diagram, but I think it does a good job of showing you all the different directions you can go from there. So you can access that information using the built-in Python interpreter and 3D Slicer or MATLAB. You can do AI and machine learning, stuff like Slicer Monai. You can do stuff like calibration, registration, things I've never actually really learned the foundation of because it's kind of solved in 3D Slicer already. And of course, if you have an image guided therapy application that you want to make, what you should be doing is writing a small percentage of code that pulls on this very large code base uh, that's been tested, developed, validated by tons of research engineers before you. And what I think is exciting about that is as PhD students, we can spend time focusing on solving unanswered research questions and not on software and engineering problems that probably someone could do better. <laughs> So switching from image guided therapy to more the robotic side of things, we're met again with the same challenge. Accessing interfaces of medical robots is typically expensive or hard to do. So we have similar tools in our arsenal from the robotic side, like Robot Operating System or ROS, which is basically a collection of libraries that I like to think of as doing sort of the heavy computational lifting for robotics. So you have access to stuff like inverse kinematic solvers, motion planning tools, the TF transformation tree, which tells you where links are with respect to each other at any given time. And for medical robots specifically, either these devices typically off the shelf have a ROS interface, or there's open source libraries like the SysSol libraries from Hopkins or the DaVinci Research Kit, which actually provide ROS interfaces for these types of robots. So, I'll preface this by saying it's an oversimplification, but starting a grad uh, degree in image added robotics, this is sort of what the development ecosystem looked like to me. Um, I realized pretty quickly that robotics researchers were primarily on ROS and Linux uh, because it was the only supported distribution for a while, whereas I was more familiar with the 3D Slicer plus sort of Windows world. So I started by looking at if there was any bridges available for these two ecosystems. And we discovered that there, of course, were other people who discovered this problem like, and developed platforms to address it, like the ROS IBTL bridge, which sends information from ROS to 3D Slicer using OpenIGT Link, the same network protocol we use for Plus. And then the video you're seeing here is actually an application that I started developing um, that sort of 
completely independent of Ross and just used OpenAI Detooling to talk to this small, inexpensive desktop manipulator. And both of these solutions kind of work, but one of the challenges is, as I mentioned, Ross has a ton of tools. So sending information on either side, you have to do the encryption and the decryption. And it's very challenging to give access to the full suite of tools in 3D Slicer and Ross and vice versa. So kind of took a step back at this problem. And when I got to Hopkins in 2021 as a visiting student, we were looking specifically at the release of ROS2, which was now operating system agnostic. And we thought maybe the solution to a problem is less of a bridge and it's more like a boat. It's something that can kind of live on either side. And as developers, we can kind of pull from what we need. And we started working on Slicer ROS2 as that boat. So the goal of Slicer ROS2 was essentially to give developers access, as I mentioned, to the full suite of tools in 3D Slicer and ROS and vice versa. And we thought that with that, sorry, that's my usual um, it would serve as a very great solution for, oh, what is it now? You'll, you'll see that in the video, but we thought it would serve as a great starting point for anyone who wanted to build an image guided robotic system and needed access to both sides of the spectrum. So under the hood, how it actually works is that on the ROS side of things, we treat 3D Slicer like a ROS node. If you're familiar with ROS, that's basically the communication mechanism that's used to communicate with different parts of a package. And on the 3D Slicer side, we treat ROS communication mechanisms like publishers, subscribers, parameters, CF2, as what 3D Slicer is used to do, which is a BTK normal node. And from that, I hope these videos load. <laughs> going to kind of steal the thunder if they don't. There we go. So what we can do with that is essentially load and visualize robots in real time with the click of a button. So what you're seeing here is the patient side manipulator of the DaVinci Research Kit. That small desktop robot looks a little better now um, with this as well. And then on the right here is a very inexpensive robot called uh, the Cobot by Elephant Robotics. Um, and what I think is exciting about this is it really if you have a ROS supported robot, meaning you have a universal robot description format, which is pretty standard, and a robot state publisher, you can get this up and running for your system with a button click. It's going a little slow. <laughs> um, okay. From there, what I think is also exciting, aside from the visualization and loading quickly. Um, what we've seen today is that Slicer can be used for image guided therapy applications. So this one in particular here is one we're working on with Dr. Krieger's group at Hopkins, which is tongue tumor resection with a robot. So here you can see we've defined a path based on preoperative imaging around a tumor. We're actually sending the robot along that trajectory. A little underwhelming, but trust me, this is very hard to do before. <laughs> And I wanted to kind of round off on a clinical example and maybe answer the question of why as a PhD student, I think Dr. Sparks pointed out we should be spending time on research, so why am I working on software? Um, so the focus of my research is breast conserving surgery, which is a common surgical treatment for women with breast cancer. Um, and the goal of these surgeries is essentially to have a surgeon remove the tumor from the breast while preserving the surrounding healthy tissue. The current standard of care is what you're seeing on the screen here. So a radiologist guides a localization wire through the tumor before the surgery starts. And they then provide the surgeon with a sketch like you can see here, this is actually a real one, which is basically where they can expect to find the tumor on that localization wire. And then the surgeon starts cutting. As you can imagine, breast tissue is very mobile. So a static image is not sufficient. And the result is that over 30% of these procedures are incomplete and the patient actually has to undergo revision surgery. So recognizing this problem, research engineers before my time at Queen's University started developing the Nightmare system, which uses preoperative ultrasound um, and electromagnetic tracking to localize the tumor relative to the surgeon's tool. And from there, we can give the surgeon a navigation interface, which you'll see in a second, which shows them where their tool is relative to the tumor as they're cutting at any given time. And what's cool about this is it was built entirely with open source tools in Slicer IBT, which I showed earlier. So my first challenge as a grad student was seeing if we could take this beyond uh, just visual feedback and add a robot 
and do some sort of cooperative robotic system so that instead of just seeing where they are relative to the tumor, maybe we could actually actuate that in some sense. And we started doing this by implementing what's called the forbidden region virtual fixture. So using that preoperative ultrasound guided tumor contour, we use that as basically a wall or a boundary. And when the surgeon hits that boundary with their tool, we apply a force to the handle. With Slicer Rossi now, you can do this in only 13 lines of code. This is probably the simplest implementation of a virtual fixture. It kind of feels like you're hitting a sticky surface when you hit the tumor. Um, and this is particularly exciting to me because it took about three years to get to this 13 lines of code. And this is a video of the system in action. The test we're doing here is with a virtual pseudo tumor, the green blob on the screen. So you can see when the tool interacts with that tumor, it turns red, but you of course can't see in the video is that there's a uh, haptic feedback applied at the handle. So they feel a bit of a sticky sensation. And the idea here is that the surgeon will be cutting, their tool is guided by the robot and themselves, and they feel that sticky sensation and retract um, and hopefully not leave residual cancer behind. So to conclude, uh, we're really excited about the Slicer OS2. Um, it's still very early days. We put the first release out in April and just started presenting this this year. Uh, we spent a lot of time on documentation and uh, the GitHub repository. So I put some links here in the QR code. Um, and we're really open to the community for feature requests, kind of where we can go with this, um, if it is something that would suit your research, uh, kind of how we can make it better. Uh, and I also just wanted to finish off by saying that, of course, this is not a single person effort. Uh, the kind of brains behind the operation here is someone named Anton Duguet, who is the lead developer of the DaVinci Research Kit, and I'm very fortunate to be mentored by him. And then we have another student, Arvind Kumar, who has a <coughs> development and a ton of advisory committees from different disciplines. And of course, there's a lot of funding that goes into being able to bounce between universities and attend here today. So yeah, I'd just like to thank everyone. Yep. So um, that diagram you showed with the um, Ross nodes and the slicer remote. So is that still a work on IGT link or is that now like in the same process space? So we've kind of uh, gotten rid of open IGT link from the process. So we basically hacked like a loadable module build process and ported it over to Ross 2's build process. So you're actually just accessing those data tapes directly and they're just packaged as VTK normal nodes. So we can use like the Python API in Slicer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was kind of a, a design decision, I guess, to abandon OpenIGT link, and we still use it, of course, for the overall application, but um, we just writing the encoding and decoding on either side is getting a bit difficult. This is maybe a very technical question, but how does your build process work then? Do you build, do you install ROS and Slicer and then installs your package on top, or is it one, one installer? Yeah, no, it's a good question. And I actually think it's kind of one of the things we need to work on. So um, if anyone's worked with 3D Slicer and you build it from source, that takes a long time. So that's one of the requirements. You have to build from source because you have one requirement, which is open SSL, and you have to <laughs> hit a flag um, to do that. So you do that, and then you just build our package on top of that as a regular ROS2 package, tell 3D Slicer where are going to find it, and then it works like any other module in Slicer. But it does take a little bit of time to set up the first time. And that's why we try to document that process. So any other yeah. uh -huh. so just just perfect. So, so if you if you want to write an application, then you can uh use the Yeah, yeah. So you can either use kind of the you can either access information from 3D Slicer using our publisher. So let's say you had a transformation in Slicer that you wanted to use. In your system from like a tracking system, you can just publish it as a topic with Slicer ROS2 and then develop as you would normally. Or if you're more 3D Slicer familiar, you can do the opposite. So send stuff from ROS and then what I usually do is write like a Python module in 3D Slicer that grabs that information and uses it. So that was kind of the kind of back and forth that we wanted to use. A lot of the students I've met don't use Slicer. So if they need something from Slicer, I just tell them how to write the publisher and then they kind of go on their way. So that's really something we wanted to emphasize here. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so.